Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to, uh, I think we can, if I can have your attention, I think it's time for us to get started. My name is Scott Nielsen, and I'm the chairman of the Las Vegas Victims Fund Committee. I'd like to welcome you all here, uh, everyone here in person, and also those participating remotely. Before we start today's meeting, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence and prayer to, to honor and remember all of those who were killed, injured, or otherwise impacted by the terrible events of 1 October. Thank you. I'm going to take just a few minutes to discuss the Las Vegas Victims Fund and the committee that's overseeing the fund, and then turn the time over to Jeff Dion from the National Center for Victims of Crime, who represents the fund administrators uh, who will conduct uh, the remainder of this meeting. The Las Vegas Victims Fund is a Nevada nonprofit corporation established to oversee the consolidation and distribution of the funds contributed as a result of the generosity of thousands of donors from around the world in response to the terrible events of October 1. As a result of a ruling from yesterday from the IRS, um, the Las Vegas Victims Fund is a 501c3 tax exempt entity. And it's not often that we get to thank the IRS, but um, we would like to publicly thank them for uh, expediting the application and getting this done so quickly so that we can continue on with our work. The Las Vegas Victims Fund Committee is a committee com consisting of, uh, it oversees the, the fund, and it's a committee co that consists of six, si 17 members of the Las Vegas community. The committee includes representatives from victims advocacy groups, Clark County, UNLV, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, Catholic Charities, charitable organizations and foundations here locally, the UFC, Zappos, and other large contributors to the fund, the gaming and resort industry, and also the legal and medical professions. Every person serving on the committee is doing so without compensation. I'd like to ask all of the members of the committee who are here tonight to please stand, and to, I'd like to thank them for their, their work and their service on this. Thank you. The purpose of the committee, our mission, is to consolidate all of the funds that have been so generously contributed and to distribute those funds in a transparent, equitable, and expeditious manner to uh, the families of the decedents and the survivors of 1 October. 100% 1 of the funds collected by the Las Vegas Victims Fund will be distributed to those families and survivors. While we know a financial gift cannot begin to lessen the traumatic impacts of this tragedy, we hope these gifts are recognized as a symbol of the love and support that have been shown by the thousands of donors and what they did um, and, and that they will help, these contributions will help the survivors and their families in some way. It's important to focus on these funds and, and what they are and what they are not. Um, we heard a lot of discussion this morning in the first meeting and it's, I think it, you need to think about these funds in a little different manner. Um, as I said, these funds are a gift from the many donors who contributed to the various fundraising efforts. These funds are not an attempt to compensate people for economic loss, for medical expenses, or for their, their medical bills, or for um, lost wages. That's not what we're doing here. There are other forms of compensation for some people, whether it's insurance or whether it's a lawsuit. But that's not the process that we're involved here in, in, in with this group. We have a, 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 an, an amount of money that's been contributed as a gift, and what we're hoping to do is distribute that, as I say, in a fair, e equitable manner to the people that have been most impacted. And so that's what we're about. If you have any questions, um, I'm sorry. The, to, to start to accomplish our mission, the committee adopted draft protocol uh, that's been made available to the public. The draft protocol is a general outline of who's eligible to receive funds, how to make claims for funds, how the funds will be distributed, and an estimated timeline for that process. It's important to emphasize that the protocol is only a draft. Today's meetings and the ability to comment online and in writing um, 
will be is are intended to invite people to comment on that draft. We really want to hear what you think and what you're thinking of this, these draft protocols, and that's why we've, we've held this meeting. If you have questions today about the draft protocol, please ask your tr questions and we will attempt to provide an answer. But we are mainly here to listen to you. We want to hear your stories. We're not going to debate uh, or uh, comments or respond to most comments. Um, no decisions will be made today about the protocol. After considering the comments at today's meetings and also the comments that are made up to the, uh, the time the period for comment, which is December 8th, the committee will then meet again to consider all of those comments and will provide a final protocol um, by December 15th. We've been assisted in drafting the protocol by Ken Feinberg and his staff and by Mai Fernandez and Jeff Dion of the National Center for Victims of Crime who will continue to work through us with us as we go through this process. Uh, Ms. Fernandez and Mr. Dion will also serve as the fund administrators and will oversee the processing of the applications and you'll hear from Jeff um, in terms of what those application process will be and a little bit more detailed information about how that will work. Mr. Feinberg, Ms. Fernandez and Mr. Dion are nationally recognized for their experience in dealing with the distribution of funds in multi-claimant situations and we'd like to thank them for their help and their guidance. Finally, just a couple of thoughts uh, and notes about how we're going to conduct the meeting tonight. First of all, if you haven't already signed in, we'd ask you to, in, and you want to speak, please sign in, and then we will call people um, as they have signed in on the sheet. We're going to go for approximately 90 minutes tonight, and we'd ask that everyone please try to limit your comments to approximately three minutes so that everyone can have an opportunity to speak and, and to be heard. So with that said, I wanna thank you again for being here. Uh, it's a very sad um, occasion that we're here, or purpose for getting together, but we appreciate you being here and we do wanna hear from you. And I'll now turn the time over to Jeff Dion from National Center for Victims of Crime. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Dion. I serve as the Deputy Executive Director of the National Center for Victims of Crime. Uh, we were founded in 1985 and we're the nation's leading resource and advocacy organization serving victims of all types of crime. Uh, and we are based in Washington, D.C., uh, but I also want to uh, introduce uh, Steve Rickman, uh, who's a member of our Board of Directors and he is a a uh, former official with the U.S. Department of Justice, but he lives out here in Las Vegas, uh, and so he's a local connection that we have that's working with us um, in this effort. Uh, the National Center is one of several organizations that have come together to support those of you who've suffered this unimaginable tragedy. Uh, we're here with you tonight to share information about the funds that are available uh, and uh, to hear your comments about the draft protocols, about the application process, and the plan for distribution. 100% of the funds that have been donated to us will be distributed to the victims of this event. But it's important to underline that funds will only be available to people who go through this application process. We're also here to help you find services, We're, and to help connect you with the folks from the Resilience Center, the people from Crime Victim Compensation, the people from the FBI, all of whom are here, and if whatever question you have, we can help find an answer and try to identify resources to help your specific situation. Um, although the circumstances that unite us are extremely difficult, we hope that our presence in your lives today and as you move forward reflect our unconditional support of each of you. We're here for you, and part of our work this evening is to listen to your needs and concerns, and we want to use this meeting to share comments and help facilitate this process for you. Um, all funding requests will include information on how to communicate directly with us in English or Spanish, as we have victim assistance specialists on staff who also speak Spanish. Uh, and among the personnel here to support you, uh, you'll also hear from a few survivors of other mass shootings from around the country, and we hope that their presence here today will give you strength, wisdom, and hope. 
Uh, so we welcome you. And now um, we'll have these opening remarks uh, conveyed in Spanish as well. Buenas noches y gracias por estar aquí con nosotros esta noche. Eh, mi nombre es Gina Olivares y soy analista principal para el condado de Clark. El señor Jeff Dion del Centro Nacional de Víctimas de Crimen me ha pedido el favor de traducir su introducción en español. Primeramente, sentimos mucho lo que han pasado las víctimas del tiroteo del festival y concierto del primero de octubre. Estamos aquí para presentarles los, los detalles de los fondos disponibles para las víctimas y las familias. También queremos escuchar de ustedes. Queremos saber lo que necesitan para su, que sus vidas sean un poco mejor después de la tragedia. También queremos saber lo que piensan del protocolo que este comité ha desarrollado para distribuir los fondos. También hay servicios en la comunidad nuestra que pueden ayudar con sus necesidades y estamos aquí para informarles de, de ellos. Después de la presentación, cada persona tendrá tres minutos para dirigir sus palabras al comité. Aseguran de inscribirse en la, tra la entrada para, para que puedan hablar en el micrófono. Tra tra trataremos de con concluir la presentación a las siete y media. Ahora pasaré el micrófono al señor Jeff Dian. Gracias y buenas noches. Thank you very much. Um, now let's walk you through this process. And I want to start uh, by saying I'm so sorry that any of us have to be here under these circumstances. And I want you to know that I'm here uh, because I once sat where you, many of you were in very similar circumstances. I'm here because my sister Paulette was murdered. She was the victim of a serial killer when she was just 23 years old. I was only 14 when that happened but it's part of the whole reason that I became an attorney and why I decided that I wanted to dedicate my career to working with crime victims. So many survivors of crime become advocates because they tell themselves, I want to make sure that what I went through doesn't happen to other people and try and make that path of recovery a little easier. So many of us who have already walked this path are here to try and help guide you along your path of recovery. No matter how much money we have or how much money we can give you, it's not going to fix things. It's not going to change things. But perhaps the knowledge that people from all over the world are donating money because they care about you and they want to help you. And hopefully that knowledge that you're not in this alone will make even more of a difference than whatever benefits we can provide through the money that's been donated. So how much money is there? Right now, there's about $16 million that have been donated to some of the various accounts. The GoFundMe account that was uh, uh, established uh, by Sheriff Lombardo and Chairman Sisolak Uh, the, there's money in the Las Vegas Victims Fund, there's money that's been donated directly to the National Compassion Fund, and as Scott said, all of that money is going to be pooled together into one pot, and we're going to distribute that to all of the victims of this crime so that you only have one place to go to access this, these funds to make it easier for you. And so all of those funds will be combined, and 100% of that money will be distributed to the victims of this event. Uh, as I said, it came from people from all over the country, uh, from all over the world. Uh, we've had donations that ranged from $500,000 to $5. Uh, and everybody gave uh, because they wanted to help and make a difference. So who is it that's eligible to benefit from these funds? Anyone who is impacted by this event, whether you were a paying guest who was attending the concert, whether you were a vendor who was working there, whether you were a, a, a bartender or a first responder. Everyone, no one, there's no distinction based on who you are, whether or not you can get uh, benefits from this fund. It does not matter whether or not you are a US citizen. It doesn't matter what your immigration status is. 
We don't care about any of those things. We're looking within the guidelines of uh, who's been impacted that we can provide assistance to. Many of you have gotten benefits from other places. And sometimes there's a question of, well, if I've gotten benefits from someplace else, can I get help here? I can tell you from our fund, we don't care where else you've gotten money. We don't care if you've had gotten money from insurance. We don't care if you're filing a civil lawsuit or you've gotten crime victim compensation. That's not going to impact your ability to get funds from us in any way, shape, or form. Some people have gotten money from crime victim compensation. And crime victim compensation, uh, which each state has, is designed to reimburse victims for their out-of-pocket expenses arising from the crime. They can reimburse you for medical expenses, mental health counseling, lost wages, funeral expenses. A state crime victim compensation program is a payer of last resort which means it sort of acts like a social safety net. They're only going to pay, uh, reimburse you for costs that no one else is reimbursing you for. So if you had a medical bill and you applied to crime victim compensation, but you had health insurance, they won't reimburse you for the part that was covered by health insurance, but if you had a copay that you needed to pay and something that was out of pocket from you, they will reimburse you for that. Now, by law and regulation, crime victim compensation programs, uh, if you get, if you, if they pay you for a benefit for a particular loss, a medical bill, a funeral bill, and then you get money from someone else for that, ex for that same loss, then they're required to, uh, they'll, they'll say you have to pay this back because there's no double dipping. That's the basic premise. Some of you may have received benefits from crime victim compensation and then maybe got funeral expenses that were covered by Zappos. And then you think, well, now I got this letter and I've got to pay that back and now that's a hassle and I've got to deal with all this. Call the folks at crime victim compensation. Just because they, they don't want to take money back from you, they want to help you. If you've gotten a benefit from someplace else, they're going to try and work with you and say, okay, is there some other loss that you have that we can attribute that benefit that we've already paid to. They're not trying to uh, get money back from you. We have uh, crime victim compensation reimburses people for economic losses, things that cost them money. As Scott said, we are not reimbursing anyone for their economic losses. We're not reimbursing for their lost wages or for their medical bills. And so because we, uh, so there's no overlap. So we have designed this so that there won't, crime victim compensation won't have a lien and won't ask you for money back. I've spoken with the folks at, at the Nevada Crime Victim Compensation Program, and I've spoken with the folks in California, and uh, our belief and understanding is that the way we have set this up, that they will not have that. But if there's any question, talk with them and it gets really detailed and uh, it, we can get in the weeds. So just know that it gets complicated, but work with them uh, and there should not be an overlap. So what's the process that you'll need to go through? One of the first questions we get is, do I need a lawyer to do this? You don't need a lawyer to apply for benefits from the fund. Can you have a lawyer do it for you? Absolutely. In the application, we're going to ask you, are you represented by a lawyer? And when we ask that question, what we mean is, are you represented by a lawyer for the purposes of applying to this fund? You don't need a lawyer, but you can have one. Now, if you have a lawyer because you're filing a lawsuit, or you have a lawyer because there's a lawyer that's helping you with a probate issue, or you have a lawyer because you were uh, had a lawyer in your divorce, that doesn't matter. It, what we want to know is, are you using a lawyer in this application process so we know if we have a question, are we going to go to you to try and get the information or are we going to work with your lawyer? 
if you do use a lawyer, many people, uh, there's a lot of good lawyers out there, and maybe if there's a lawyer that is representing you in a civil lawsuit or is helping you with a probate matter, that they might look at this and say, we can do this for you uh, and help you with this process and help complete this paperwork, that's great. Don't let a lawyer take any money from you or take any percentage of what is being distributed from this fund as a fee. There's no lawyering required to get money from this, and so they can help fill out, help you with the paperwork, but uh, please don't let them do that. Um, everyone, so the, the applications are going to be online, uh, and so that's gonna help us to uh, be able to serve more people more quickly. If you don't have a computer, or you don't have access to the internet, give us a call. We will make special arrangements with you and get you in touch with people who will help you complete your online application. Everyone who applies for benefits is going to have to be validated in two ways. Everyone who applies is gonna to have to be validated by the FBI that they were a victim of this crime. We have an obligation to all of the people around the world that donated money to make sure that they wanted to donate money to the victims of this crime, and we have to make sure that those are the people that we're giving it to. We also have an obligation to each of you. Because we're giving away 100% of what was donated, if we give money to someone who wasn't a victim of this crime, then it's taking money away from the people who were. And so everyone has to be validated by the FBI. And so when we get an application, we send an email to the FBI and we said we got an application from John Smith who was a victim of the October 1st shooting. And the FBI is gonna go and they're gonna look on their victim list and they're gonna come back and they're gonna say yes, John Smith is validated as a victim or no, we don't have him on our list. If he's not on their list, what they're gonna do is they're gonna send an FBI agent out to speak with him uh, because they want to get a complete statement from everybody that was there, and then they might come back and say, okay, we can validate this person. That's why if any of you visited the Family Assistance Center, maybe to claim lost property or something, that at the Family Assistance Center, they asked you, have you spoken with someone from law enforcement? Who did you speak with? If you haven't spoken from someone with law enforcement and you went and claimed personal property, then they had FBI agents there who would speak with you and take a statement. And so they are building that list of validated victims. So everyone's gotta be validated by the FBI. The, um, the other thing, the other validation that people need is we've gotta check you against a list that's put out by the US Department of Treasury Office of Foreign Asset Control, the ISDN list. And basically that is a list by law, we are not allowed to give money to anybody on that list. That list is basically drug dealers and terrorists. I've never checked on a, a victim of a mass casualty crime and had them come up, but it's just something we have to check against. Um, uh, and so it has nothing to do with immigration status or other crimes that you have to be specifically on this list that we're not allowed to give them money. So those are the two checks that everybody is gonna go through as part of this application process. For injury claims, you will also, as part of your application, um, authorize your medical provider to release some limited information to us. For people who are injured, we just need to validate with your medical provider uh, that you were injured as a result of October 1st and if you were hospitalized, how many nights you were hospitalized. And so they'll provide that information. If you tell us in your application, I was hospitalized for 12 nights, and then we talk to the hospital and they say, oh, we have them that they were hospitalized for seven nights. Then we're gonna go back and we're gonna ask you, and you're gonna say, well, I was hospitalized for seven nights, they sent me home, you know, three days later I got an infection, I went back in the hospital for five days. Uh, and then we go back and try to say, oh, we didn't realize you meant cumulative. So we're gonna be asking the hospital for the cumulative number of nights that someone was hospitalized as a result of their injuries. 
the only exception, the only way that we're going to need any information, any um, substantive or qualitative information about someone's injury is if someone who is injured suffered permanent brain damage or paralysis. If that's the case, we're gonna wanna know that because under the draft protocols, people who suffered that severe an injury will receive the highest level of benefits which will be equal to death benefits. So for that type of injury, we're gonna need that, uh, the confirmation from the medical provider for that. For death claims, it becomes more complicated. When there's a death claim, the first thing we have to make sure is that we're dealing with the appropriate person who represents the decedent's estate. If someone was killed and they have a will and they've identified someone in the will to serve as executor of their estate, that's great. File the will and we'll know that that's the right person to deal with. If someone was married at the time they were killed, then their spouse can apply. If the person did not have a will or was not married at the time of their death, then we're gonna ask that someone be appointed as personal representative of the estate by the probate court, and it's the probate court that has jurisdiction, is the probate court where the person who died lived. So if they lived in California, if they lived in Nevada, that's the, the probate court that's gonna have jurisdiction. There were people who were killed were from 10 different states and two provinces of Canada. And so we're gonna look to the law there of who is the appropriate person to be appointed as personal representative. There may be multiple claims. There might be multiple people who think, I should be appointed as personal representative. They can file, we might get duplicate claims on a death claim. And we are going to look to who, if, if everybody can agree on who the personal representative is, that's great. If they can agree, we're gonna look to who does the probate court say that the personal representative is. Being appointed as a personal representative, it's different in every state. Some states it could take 30 days or more for that to happen. So if you think you're in a situation like that, I would urge you to please start that process now so that it doesn't delay you receiving benefits from this fund. If someone died without a will, every state has a law called an intestacy statute, which basically says if someone dies without a will, this is who gets what. And they're generally the same, but they're different for each state, but generally they go something like this. If someone was married at the time of their death, the spouse gets everything. If someone was married at the time of their death and they have children, and all of the children came from that marriage, the spouse gets everything. If someone was married at the time of their death, but even one of their children had a parent that was not the spouse, maybe from a previous marriage or something, then the spouse gets half and all the children get half and that's split in equal shares. If someone was not married and didn't have kids, generally it goes to the parents. If their parents were not still alive, then it would go to siblings. We are a charity and we, we're offering a gift. And so we just look to, we are not bound by this, but we look to this as this is a reasonable way to determine who should get what. And so we look to the probate law of the state for guidance. If you have a death claim, you will be asked to submit a personal distribution plan. And that distribution plan could say, I'm the spouse, 100% is gonna come to me, and that could be fine. You can also say, uh, you know, I'm the spouse and I'm gonna have this percentage come to me, but I'm also, we're gonna give some to the decedent's cousin who was like a sibling, they were very close, or you can do whatever you want with the money as long as the people who are legal heirs agree to it, all right? If 
the legal heirs do not agree, then we're going to deposit that money with that probate court and they can sort it out. It's in everybody's best interest to reach consensus and reach agreement about the distribution of those funds. If there are any minor children <coughs> who receive benefits from the fund, the laws are different in every state. And so when we did this in Florida, you couldn't give more than $13,000 to a minor without the court approving it and the court appointing someone as a guardian of that money to look after that money until the child turns 18. So if anybody, if there is a, any minor beneficiaries that are going to receive money, they might need uh, legal assistance because there might need to be a, a court process for the judge to approve that and appoint someone to look after that money. Because in a death claim, the benefits are based on the relationship between the beneficiaries and the decedents, you might need to submit documentation to support those relationships. So if there are children that are getting benefits, then you'd need to have a birth certificate that shows that they were the children of the decedent. If someone was a spouse, you might need to submit a uh, marriage certificate. If someone was previously married and was divorced, you might need to submit a uh, proof of the divorce so we know that even if they were remarried, that that current marriage was valid. So, but you'll be walked through that process on the types of documentation that you might need. When you submit your claim, you'll also be asked to provide payment information so that when, you know, how you want this to be paid. Do you want it to be paid by check? Do you want it to be paid by electronic transfer? If you want it to be paid by electronic transfer, they're going to ask you for the routing number and account number. And so that when that is approved, that they'll be able to transmit money the way that you've asked for it. Sometimes the account, the routing, you know, you've entered the routing number incorrectly. So we certainly will go back if there's a problem, we're going to ask. I know after um, uh, after the Pulse shooting, when we as we were distributing benefits, that it would come back and sometimes this bank number doesn't make sense and we'd go back and work with the, uh, the applicant and work with their bank and make sure we had all of the appropriate information. So we're going to walk you through this process and if there's something that isn't working right, we're going to be in touch with you to get the appropriate information. Um, so I think that is the, uh, the general process that we're going to go through to determine this. Um, so also, one more thing about uh, eligibility. Um, the current draft protocols limit eligibility to the families of those who were killed and the people who were hospital, who were physically injured and hospitalized. That is a draft protocol. The, uh, so we want to hear from people. You can s share your comments tonight. We encourage anyone who's watching online to send in an email or send a written letter. Um, the deadline for submitting comments or feedback on the draft protocol is December 8th. After December 8th, this committee is going to review all of that feedback and then they're going to make a decision on what the final protocol will be that will govern the distribution of these funds. Uh, and I'm, we're very grateful uh, to the local committee whenever we do this. It's very important that there be a local steering committee that's appointed because we want to make sure that this is a community effort that's informed and influenced by people representing this community and its community values. What about this fund that's online and says they're collecting for victims? Do you know who they are? 
And, uh, and oftentimes, I don't, I say, I don't know who they are. And I want to give a shout out to the press and the Review Journal who's tracking, who, who looks at all the people that say they're collecting money for victims and they're going to follow up because I know how hard it is to give money to victims, to even know who the victims are. So, if, so to everyone out there, if you, someone is collecting money or doing a fundraiser and they say the money's going to victims, always ask how. Uh, and if they say they're giving money to the Las Vegas Victims Fund or the National Compassion Fund, you can trust that because you know that's going into this process. If it's not doing that, then be, please be very wary because it might mean that they're, you know, I hate to see people raising money on the backs of victims. Um, now, uh, and so, but you can also see that the very disturbing, stark, horrible reality of what happens to mass shooting victims is what informs this process. Everything that we're doing is formed by what's happened before as this committee does their very best with the resources that are available to them, and we certainly want there to be more resources available, but what they have available to do the right thing to help the people of this community. And now we'd like to hear from you and take your questions. People have signed up, and so I'm gonna call out a list of people, and if you could line up at the um, uh, at the microphones there so that everybody can hear you. And our first set of speakers uh, are Shauna Bartlett, Stacy Armentrout, Marilee Caldwell, uh, Sarah Schroerluck, Yvonne Justice, Ed Milam, Christine Schalk, and Neptali Paradis. Um, and so if you folks could come uh, and we'd be happy, you can ask a question for clarification. You can share your thoughts or comments. We're happy to hear from you. Uh, Shauna? Before I get started, I'm going to pass packets out that we made for the panel here of just very few stories that were shared with us to speak on their behalf tonight. I won't be sharing my story tonight, as I'll be speaking on one of my family members, Lori Korn, and her friends, Janelle and Jane. They escaped with their lives. Their lives have been forever changed by this incident, and they still struggle with the mental and emotional trauma that continues daily in their lives. Here is their story. They were having an amazing weekend, weekend doing what they love. By day three, despite going to bed before midnight, Friday and Saturday, so not like them, they were all tired. But when in Rome, Jane was napping and Lori and Janelle were enjoying artists. Janelle woke up, woke her mom up, and Jane at 7 p.m. with a call. Jane thought about staying in, staying in, but decided to rally for Jason Aldean because her daughter didn't raise no quitter. They all met up about 9 p.m. at their bar where they had met so many more friends at Loser's Lounge. They didn't like to ever separate, and they have a plan anytime they do. They were in the front of the stage standing every night. They've made lots of friends. They are all alive. That night was different. Their fourth friend went home, just the three of them now. They found seats for the first time in the front row of so many rows of beach chairs, not theirs. Jake Owen was finishing. Lori changed her mind. She had never seen Jason Aldean. Janelle and, Miami ha Janelle and Mimi had. She wanted to get back to the front where they were each night before. It was easy when you were, on, when you were one. Janelle stayed with her mom. This separated them. This made the worst situation of their life worse. They were separated. Janelle heard a loud noise. She said, I think a transformer blew. Jane said, look at the smoke toward the Mandalay Bay. Then the first round, Janelle immediately told her mom, those were gunshots and they need to get up. She knew. She told her mom, we are being attacked. We have to get up. But Jason Aldean was still playing. People are looking for fireworks. They were up and Janelle knew Lori was in front of them. It was too late. As the second wave came from all directions, the lights went out. Janelle threw her mom down and covered her with every pound she had. The shot stopped. The screams were everywhere. Then came the stampede. They had to get up. They didn't get far, dove again to the ground. This time, Janelle grabbed the man next to her and asked him to take care of her mom. Janelle thought she did this because she thought Janelle was shot. While face down, Janelle called her husband and told him she was under attack. She told him goodbye. He heard more shots and they lost service. The next few minutes, they were trying to find cover, playing dead, trying to keep running, trying to escape, 
trying to not get trampled and waiting the amaz for the amazing first responders to take out the gunmen, shooting at them from all directions. Spray of bullets came, comes across them from behind, then from each side. There was no safe place to go as they went away from the Mandalay Bay. People were scaling fences. There was no safe place which, with rounded barbed wire at the top. People were pushing fences down. People were on the ground. People were running. People were hiding, and people were everywhere being hunted and trying to survive. They made it through a broken down fence and saw the Tropicana. Janelle said, Mom, we don't have Lori. We have to get to Lori, but had to hide behind a truck. Then get up, get out. You are not safe here. Run from police. They didn't want to run with the masses. They couldn't. They took another route and ended up outside the Tropicana pool. They were trapped as, again as people barricaded the doors. They saw the MGM Grand. They made a run for it as people screamed, they're coming this way. They got inside. News was breaking on TV. The casino was on lockdown. Everyone was confused as many others ran in, some injured. They were shocked. Danielle was trying to phone her husband. They were up against a wall away from the open lobby. Then came another stampede. She threw her mom down. Then Beryl rolled over her to get her up against the wall from the runners. They saw the cashier sneak inside a side door. She told her mom, we have to get into the safe room. They did. Janelle called her husband. It was then he told, was, told them Lori was alive. Stacy. This year was a little different for us. The last few years, my husband and I attended the 391 concert. This year, we decided that it would be fun to take our children, our 12 and 15-year-old daughters, Night we were sitting there having fun, enjoying it, watching the joy on my daughter's faces. When we heard the first round, and we looked at each other, my husband and I did. Not sure, thinking it was gunfire, not 100% sure. Then the second round, we threw our children to the ground to protect them. We did not know where it was coming from. <coughs> stopped, we got up to run. <laughs> our oldest was just out of our reach when the next round hit. A man behind us covered her for us because we couldn't reach her because of the crowd. The only escape we could do was go between food trucks. It was there that my husband, trying to protect us, broke his ribs because there was so much stuff there he was pushing it, trying to protect his family. My children are still scarred. We managed to get them out physically unharmed, despite my husband and I being physically harmed from escaping and running. As a lot of you may have seen, this past Saturday we had Thanksgiving dinner for survivors to come together and celebrate. What you didn't know was that when we sat down to the tables, our 15-year-old had a panic attack because she couldn't handle the crowd of the room. And we had to help her at 15 overcome a panic attack. She's not the first one. And she's not alone. Our 12-year-old has them. 12 and 15. Suffering. Dealing with this sleepless nights, nightmares, heartache, It was our job to protect them, not our job to keep them safe. <laughs> we took them there. <sighs> well, your heart tells you it's not your fault, but you tell your brain that as you hold your child <laughs> who is suffering and crying uncontrollably. Okay. Um, first, I just want to thank um, the committee and um, everyone here. We really appreciate all of you taking the time to um, listen to our stories. And um, I have been a lifelong resident of Las Vegas, and um, I can say that I never would imagine that something like this would happen in my home. 
um, and I am a survivor of Route 91. And um, this story I am reading on behalf of Jennifer and Justin McGrath, who were unable to be here. Um, but it really struck a chord with me because a lot of um, the things that I'm about to explain, um, I too um, experienced this along with um, my girlfriend that I was with that night celebrating um, my birthday. Um, Jennifer and Justin laid on the field during all 15 rounds that were fired. They laid on that field bracing themselves to be shot every time the assailant would reload, expecting that they would be hit. They prayed when the shots would pause that it would be for the last time. They laid next to a stranger, one of the 58 angels that would soon to take her last breath, but they couldn't let her do it alone, stranger or not. Jennifer and Justin carried this person off of the field, maneuvering through a sea of dead bodies, carrying her out to the street, to the street where there were only more victims and deceased remains. Jennifer and Justin helped to care for victims while they were shot. Jennifer struggled to lift another victim that was shot in the head into a car for a stranger to take to the emergency room. Her husband performed CPR, applied pressures, tourniquets to those who were bleeding out. They went back into the venue and brought out another man who was still breathing and again wading through the deceased that laid abandoned in the field, soaked in blood. That night, they saw things and experienced things that no one should ever see, ever. These things that are in their minds and also mine and a lot of people here it's something that we process every single day, and it's something that is a constant, and you cannot get it out of your head, no matter what you try to do. They returned to California the next day, unable to walk into the air airport to fly. They drove 10 hours home in a rental car. For weeks, Jennifer couldn't leave the house. Since October 1st, neither Jennifer nor Justin have gone a day without crying. They both own their own businesses and have not been able to work like they had before the concert. Their businesses are their only source of income for them and their young children. They sleep, they sleep sporadically, often waking up in sweats or in terror. Both are in therapy. Jennifer has been diagnosed as clinically depressed and diagnosed she would never ha and a diagnosis that she would never had prior to 10-1. I just want to know if Jennifer and Justin are considered victims and if there is some type of compensation or something that we can do for these people who are suffering severely from PTSD and who have had to witness these things. Although their injuries may not be physical and something that, that you can see, it's, it's definitely, it's there and it's, and it's real. Um, so again, please try to keep these people in mind as you're making your decisions. And again, thank you all. Um, we really do appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sarah? Um, I'm, uh, I, I wasn't sure of the forum, but um, I'm here more to volunteer from a business perspective to help you in any way that, um, that that myself and the company that I currently work for, I moved back here um, after living 35 years in the D.C. area, and um, I survived 9/11 and um, in the D.C. area. And uh, so, anyway, any any way that we can help, and I'll give you my information that we can help you. I'd be more than happy to to do. Great, that. thank you so much for doing that. And if after the meeting you can connect with uh, with Scott and then uh, we'd love to have your assistance. Thank All you right. so much. Um, Yvonne? Thank you. So I was there. I am a survivor, but I'm here tonight to talk on behalf of someone who couldn't be here, and I will read his story. It's Anthony, and I'm going to butcher the name, Dario, Daryl, Michael, something along that line. It's D-A-L. R-Y-M-P-L-E. Anthony escaped with his life, but he was affected emotionally and financially. He's a veteran of the United States Army. On October 1st, it was dredged up 
former symptoms of prior history of PTSD. It has also affected his family financially. His wife, Kimberly, was also at the event and has been very much traumatized by it. Anthony worked at night to help support his family, but he hasn't worked since the event because his wife is terrified of the dark and to be home alone at night with their 12-year-old son. Stories like this we hear all day, every day. This is just one of so many. The lives of this entire family have been changed. Under the current draft protocol, Anthony is not considered a victim. These families need help. My appeal to you would be to consider some of these stories. Just because they didn't stay in the hospital doesn't mean they should not receive some type of support. Thank you very much. Ed? Hello. Um, I have a question. Um, here initially, if I could, just about the process you spoke on, um, things being verified through the FBI, I understand that, and then did I hear you clearly that after that it is uh, to be verified by the medical provider? If there's a physical injury, we just need a um, uh, verification of from the medical provider that yes, this person received treatment. Okay. Um, our story, I'm here on behalf of my daughter, Jessica. Um, she was shot, and we spent five weeks in this city, 35 days in the hospital, um, actually two hospitals. Um, so, I don't know, a, a couple of things. I would ask that this committee make sure that they don't, in expediting this, which everybody wants, don't make timelines so stringent on people um, that have to deal with large <laughs> medical facilities and dealing with people that, you know, you're not going to get answers from. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to approach some of these people to give you something and get it like that. I'm going to wait. Um, so I just ask that that get built into your system. Absolutely. And just so you know, we try to make it easy for you so you don't have to get anything from the providers. Okay. All you have to do is identify and tell us who the providers were and give us their contact information and sign the release. Then, we, then it's going to be our job to go after them and get that information from them. We don't make you chase that stuff down. Okay, thank you. And can that, will that be as simple as a hospital name? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, the other thing I would like to do, you know, my daughter easily fits into your protocol. And I read it and had one comment, and I agree with it. Um, you know, I spoke to some of these folks when I got here. Um, I, I would just like to read this story that I was given. Uh, Melissa R. Fiaro escaped with her life but was shot. The bullet entered her shoulder and broke her scapula. The bullet fragmented and is still inside her, never to be removed for doing so would cause greater harm than good, and now her life has become a constant struggle. It is an estimated year for her to recover from the gunshot wound. This year will, will consist of painful physical therapy twice a week for which she is going, on, uh, going to now. The constant pain and the inability to do things for herself, such as getting dressed or undressed, are things uh, which she goes through every day. She was transported by ambulance to Sunrise Hospital where she stopped, where they stopped the bleeding and performed x-rays and scans to, access the, to assess the damage. Uh, she was then released from the hospital at 6 a.m. Under your protocol, I, I don't believe um, that this woman would receive help, um, but I think that she certainly has circumstances that Although discharged, um, she's still going to be dealing with physical injuries from a bullet. So, again, uh, maybe for some of those things that don't meet your protocol now, uh, a window for you to look at all those cases individually. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you, Ed. Um, is uh, Christine Schalk or uh, Neptali Paradis? Okay, then we'll go on to our next uh, group. Uh, Renee Smith Black, Heather Goose, 
uh, Larissa Lay. Oh, and you don't have to get up. If you want to, I can bring you a, a hand. I can bring you a mic when it's your turn. Are you sure? Okay. All right. Renee? I'm sorry. That's okay. Turn it down. There you go. Thank you for appointed committee members um, for listening to us this evening. My heart's racing a million miles a minute. Um, my name is Renee Smith Black, and my husband Griffin Black and I were survivors of the Route 91 massacre. We were a part of the bar staff, and um, it was our third day, totally exhausted. And at that time, I was probably, my husband says I was 50 yards from the stage. I was under the East Towers. We were about 30 deep in people at that time when Jason Aldean went on. When we first heard the shots, it was a very patriotic day, and as veteran business owners, and um, veteran advocates in the city of Las Vegas. We are very proud of the crowd most of the day. It was a very patriotic crowd. So we looked back at that first time and just thought that it was a part of the show, you know, um, some more honoring of our veterans. Um, went back to bartending. The next round of shots, the bartender on my right started yelling because somebody approached our bar. They'd been shot. Call 911. People started falling at the bar in front of us. That time we crawled out. I'm not even sure what happened to my fellow bartenders at that time. Um, I crawled out between an ATM machine and the bar, and people were getting hit around me. In this time of fright or flight, you know, you don't see everything going on around you. You know, and you have extreme tunnel vision for most of us. I can make sense of the times where I stopped. I crawled along the ground. I got stepped on. I lost my shoes when somebody fell on me. Still don't even know if they were a part of the dead. Made myself to another set of bars. At that time, I didn't think I was going to survive. There was, I can picture the person that had got shot in the head leaning against a bar dead, people crawling on top of us, saying I'm figuring out and wondering if I was going to die and what being shot felt like. I had scratches on my knees, on my elbows. I made it out of there through the gate and made it behind the church to get in the SWAT team, still continuing to tell us you got to keep moving, there's shooters on the ground. And totally needing water at this time, remembering the cotton feeling in my mouth and, and barely being able to stand up and continuing to go to find myself in the escapology place of all things. Opening up the door and having a camo netting on the wall and hiding with some other people behind that wall. At this time, I didn't even know if my husband had gotten out. We had a 17-year-old daughter at home who the week before her father was in the struggle in Puerto Rico. I didn't call my daughter that night thinking and hoping she was asleep and we'd get out and we'd explain things to her the next day. But there was a chance neither of us was coming home. Griffin, as a veteran, stood behind helping people get up off the ground, getting people over the fence, making sure they got out to safety. It was about an hour later when we figured out um, and got together thanks to Glimpse on our smartphones because I was in no way able to even text at that time. To come out of that, that hiding with all of the fear, with the choppers and the police and everybody around us and the dead on the ground and people draped over their loved ones. You know, as a veteran advocate, we see PTSD every single day. I talk to these people every single day. Yes, the logistics and the nightmare of trying to prove everybody that was there, there's so many fraudulent claims. People come out of the woodworks when things like this happen. 
but there's more than 58 dead, more than 547 injured. You have up to 20,000 people, not everybody was there at that time, that are victims of October 1st. I was asking one of my veterans that help people get their VA claims tonight. I said, you know, what does a PTSD victim in the military get? He said, Renee, he said, I got 20% 20 for losing my, my eye. Somebody with an amputation gets 50% compensation. Somebody with PTSD, depending on the severity, gets up to 100% compensation from the VA. 100% compensation is over $3,000 a month for the rest of their lives. Yes, we are successful business owners. We are veteran business owners. But again, my husband and I, we work these events as a way to supplement our income. That's why we were there. Most of my bar staff, most of the workers that work these events are people that are looking to supplement their income because they're single parents, they're people that don't have any other way, and most of them don't have health insurance. These people that don't have health insurance and the people that struggle, it's not fair to say that they're not victims under the protocols. The facts are that people with PTSD will have 1,500 to $4,000 a year just in physical therapy. Over $7,000 a year between physical therapy and lost production and wages. That's over $10,000 over a four year time. And what can that add up to? Because some people will get over things a little bit at a time from five months. Some will be considered chronic with PTSD and it'll be a lifetime of injuries and physical. People with PTSD have more than mental issues. They struggle with anxiety. They struggle with more heart attacks. There's a lot more physical issues that come out of it. And some people will not even realize until that day they wake up. It could be two years later when they wake up out of the cold sweat with these nightmares and their issues will begin. It's been over 14 years since Griffin was in Iraq. Just o a little over a year ago, he was in Texas working in the oil fields. He came back with these issues of PTSD that I had never was aware of, shaking in his sleep after this last attack. He's up all night, pacing, sleeping, shaking, and these are not physical issues. These are things that people can't see, people that won't even come out and say they're dealing with it because of the fear of weakness. I ask you to please consider all the other victims, even though it might take a little bit more effort to prove their claims, but consider them because they're just as much a victim as not taken away from the deceased or the people who are in the hospital. These people have lifetime issues that are gonna need to be taken care of. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Heather? I'm not that short. Hi, uh, my name is Heather Goose. Uh, I also was a bartender at the event. Uh, it wasn't supplementing my income, it was my income. Um, trying not to cry because what you said spoke to me. I stayed behind. I got trampled by 5,000 people being pushed through my bar. I pushed a fence down so that people wouldn't climb over each other and hurt each other more. <laughs> I carried bodies on metal gates that an hour before had barricaded the stage from the front row. I had my finger in the bullet hole in the back of one of the victim's heads. He was breathing, but not conscious. And the next day he passed away. I held the hand of a complete stranger when he took his last breath. I answered his phone and I found out who he was and I stayed with him that night. And I sat in the cold, <laughs> covered in blood for four or five hours until we could make sure that everybody knew who he was 
and that his loved ones who were in lockdown could get to him. The things I saw and the things I did, they affect me every single day. The night terrors, the memories, it's so very real. But the physical injuries are there too. I didn't go to the hospital that night. I was sitting behind the venue in lockdown, holding the hand of a body of somebody that I didn't know. It was a week later before I could go to the doctor. I get shots now in my back because I have bulges in my discs. I don't know if it's from pushing the fence. I don't know if it's from pulling bodies through my bar. I don't know if it's because I lifted a 300 pound man into the back of a truck so they could take his DOA body to the hospital so that he could be reunited with his loved ones. But I'm, I've got physical injuries that have nothing to do with being at the hospital. I have mental injuries that I'm gonna have to live with for the rest of my life. The fund should be 60, 70, 80 million. There's no, absolutely no reason at all why it's not five, six, seven times higher, especially with all the different things that people have done, not just in, our, in America, in our whole world to support us. But I also don't think under the protocol that you're calling for right now, I call myself a survivor. I'm not a victim, but I am a victim. And under your current protocol, I don't matter. And I do matter, and so do all the other people that were around us matter. The things that we did, the things that we saw, the things that we'll never forget, mentally, physically, they're not going away tomorrow. They're not going away next week. They're not going away a year from now. It's been two months, and to me, it feels like it was yesterday. I remember everything. And it's not getting better yet. And I feel more like a victim by not fitting into the protocol and being told I'm not a victim than I felt even that night. But again, I appeal to like, for you guys to look at your protocol and to look at, I do not take anything away from this man's amazing daughter who fought for her life and is out and is gonna have like, I hope the most amazing life for our 58 angels. But we're living with this every single day as well. And we need to be considered. And then we also need to do everything in our power to get that fund to 60, 70, 100 million so that there isn't an issue about is there gonna be enough money for any single one of us. But again, I'm a victim, but I'm a survivor, and I'm gonna get through this, but, but you know, a little bit of help and support would go a really long way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not, Marissa? Yeah, I'm not really gonna get into my story. <laughs> I was uh, injured in a, just by, I was helping people, but, um, I just had questions as far as um, how will we find out if we meet the criteria, and um, are you aware of what um, admission to hospital criteria is now? It's not like it used to be. Um, I'm a nurse. I work. As, I worked as an insurance case manager, and um, you don't go to the ER anymore and get admitted for just anything. Um, staying overnight at the hospital, you have to pretty much have pretty legitimate reason to be there. Um, a victim, if they knew the system, they could have gone in, they could have said, oh, I have chest pain, and then they could have stayed there. You know, there's many ways that you can get around, you know, doing things. Um, fortunately, I um, had, I ended up having to have surgery as a result of what had happened. Um, I was never hospitalized, fortunately, and I didn't go to the ER until a few days after because I was, I had left one job and gone to another, and I was 11 days without insurance, <laughs> um, which I'm normally never without. Um, this has left me, and I know, you know, this is my problem. This is not your problem. This is not the GoFundMe's problem. This is 
I'm an adult, it's my responsibility to be responsible for myself. Um, however, if you think for one minute that all of the events that transpired that night and it leading to me not being able to work for four months and I've had to use all of my savings, I'm single, I'm a single mother, my daughter's in college. Um, if you think that I own my own home and my car and I'm, I don't live paycheck to paycheck, I never have, but I've, this has caused me to have to go through my savings, live on my credit cards. Um, I reached out to the victims of crime. I was very misled, very, very misled through the victims of crime. This whole thing has been completely misportrayed. I'm extremely upset, I'm scared. I have, I'm very scared. I won't take, I haven't taken any money from them because I'm afraid they're gonna come after me. I have let them take my co-pays for my medical bills. Thank God for Dr. Tony Watson. He did the surgery for me and said, I'm not gonna accept any money from you, so whoever knows him, I'd like to, <laughs> if you see him, thank him for me. <laughs> and uh, Sunrise Hospital, I did go to ER two days afterwards because after the, what had happened, I was in a great deal of shock. I didn't even take a shower for two days. But um, if you think that the loss of income isn't a part of being traumatized and isn't a part of your life, you have another thing coming. I'd like for you to put yourself in some of, maybe in my position and be independent, own your own home and have worked for everything you have and literally be an 11 day window. <laughs> and because you didn't go, because you didn't meet insurance criteria to be in the hospital, but you have to be off work for four months and you don't fit into a window and you legitimately receive, you know, obtain an injury out of the goodness of your heart by helping others. See if that doesn't affect you and how that affects your life. So, and um, at any rate, I do want to thank all of you for donating your time and it's very kind of all of you. And for everyone who donated the money and regardless of whether I'm entitled to it or not, I think it's, the whole night was a horrible tragedy, but amongst tragedy was a beautiful thing because many, many people worked together. And there was, there were so many people there that um, walked away and they suffer with a lot of guilt. And that breaks my heart because my story happened to go national and it was very difficult for me. And I did interviews because, and it never really got portrayed, but because I wanted to tell people that because I stayed and I helped didn't make me a hero, if everyone stayed, it would have been worse. And everyone that was there was a hero. It took everyone doing everything for it to be the way it was. And it was how it was and we all have to move on and we all have to accept it. And we can't change it. So just be thankful for the good things and for the lady that, the bartender right here, this young lady, you know, you have to try to focus on the good things that you were able to do. Try to focus on those things. You can't live your life like that because you just can't do it. You have to. You have to focus on the positive that you were able to do. I just, I, I hope that you're able to do that. So that's all. Thank you very much. Our final group of speakers are Matt Caldwell, Anna Marie Newton, Angel Gomez, Eric Frazier, Maritza King, Victor Rivera, Barbara Caston, and Cindy Baca. If folks could please line up at the uh, microphones. Go ahead. Oh, the, 
Yeah, the applications are not available yet. The, there is, the, it's gonna be an electronic application. Um, Salesforce has volunteered pro bono to help us create this system. Uh, and our timeline calls for applications uh, to be available at the beginning of December. So if you, uh, everyone who wants information, please make sure you have gone to uh, the nationalcompassionfund.org and signed up on our victim contact form. If you got an email about this then from us, then you're already on that list. We've got about 2,200 people that are on that list. Anybody can sign up. If we've got your information, you're gonna get an email. One, you're gonna get an email that's gonna tell you uh, that the uh, committee has approved final protocols and what those are, and then also information about when the application's ready and what you need to do and what those deadlines are. So that's the best way for us to stay in touch with everyone. Matt? Yes. I just wanna say, first of all, thank all of you guys for volunteering your time and being here. That really means a lot. I know it's a lot of time and effort. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Matt Cobble. I'm a detective with school police out here in Las Vegas. Been officer for about 11 years. I did respond there that night, but that's not why I'm here. To, I'm not here to talk about that. My sister was there also, and she asked me to read this. I'm here on behalf of Brandon White. Brandon escaped with his life, but was shot. He suffered fragmentation wounds, torn ligaments, and emotional damage. His life has been turned upside down. Brandon is a police officer in Arizona. He has lost significant income from not being able to work. To make ends meet, he was employed to work off duty security jobs and worked as a landscaper, all of which are gone. He has used every hour of sick time, and even though he has been allowed to work an office position for now, he is looking at possible surgery on his foot and ankle, and it will have to get done with no sick time. Sleep has been affected, and he has significant pain every day. Brandon is a victim. Brandon deserves help. Brandon, as well as others, other families of the fallen and the survivors of this tragedy, desperately need and deserve help. Please don't forget them. That's all. Thank you very much. And, and once again, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Anna Marie? You can turn that down. Okay, um, I'm here on behalf of my daughter and my niece that were working as bar staff as well. Uh, my daughter was part of the management crew that hired a lot of those people and she is a victim and a survivor because I'm in medical school as a respiratory trainee therapist. Um, she didn't go to the hospital that night. She actually, after she crawled out and hid under those portable trailers and was able to make her way to the Tropicana, she then was told another active shooter was there and they were hustled, crawling around like a military crawl underneath tables. And my ex-husband, who's a retired law enforcement, he and I, for 35 years, protected our children, so we thought, he had just had bypass surgery, so he couldn't go. I couldn't go get her the Tropicana I, where she was. The strip was closed down until 4.30 in the morning. She, um, this strong, spunky little Italian chick is afraid of a balloon popping. Um, Halloween to take her kids trick-or-treating, looking over her shoulder. She isn't here tonight because she can't handle crowds. She is going to therapy. She has PTSD, um, nightmares. My niece is also in therapy. Um, they're being, working in ICU as a medical student, all of the patients that I work with don't have visual injuries and illnesses. They lie beneath the skin. My daughter's lie in her head. Um, she's not mental, but she has mental injuries. And I want you guys to consider that, of course, these people that lost their life, I'm so sorry for that. Those that were shot, I am so very sorry for that. And I hope that you do take care of them and their families, but please do not discount the other individuals that have other injuries. Like the girl said, that's the nurse. You really have to have some thing for them to keep you overnight. The um, beds that they keep you in in the hallway in the emergency room, you're not really an inpatient, but you're there and then they send you home. So if you would please give some more thought to your decision and your protocol. Great, thank you. Angel? Hi, my name is Angel Gomez and I just got that, that was nice. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a survivor, and I'm here on behalf of Michelle Little. Michelle escaped with her life, but was shot in the foot. However, the bullet did not go all the way through her steel-tipped boot. She had a double mastectomy on September 19th, and due to all the falling, hiding, and running required to save her life that night, she has suffered many complications up to and including emergency surgery on November 4th, which required hospitalization, seven rounds of oral antibiotics, and 14 days of IV antibiotics, which required a PICC line and IV injections to be given every eight hours by her husband, also a 91 survivor. She has not returned to work yet. She seemed she sees a, a psychiatrist on a weekly basis, and due to her injuries, she is still struggling to heal mentally. After her mastectomy, she was scheduled to return to work on October 10th, but because of her physical trauma and damage from that night, her return to work date has yet to be determined. Sleep is near impossible, and the idea of leaving her house unless absolutely required is terrifying for her. Are you saying that Michelle is not a victim? Are you saying that Michelle does not deserve help? Michelle, as well as other families of the fallen and the survivors of this tragedy desperately need and deserve our help. The things Michelle and her husband witnessed and suffered that night will not soon be forgotten. Please do not forget about her. Thank you. Uh, Eric Frazier, is Eric here? All right, uh, Maritza. My name is Maritza King, and my English no is good. Uh, this is She's asked me to translate for her. Her name is Maritza King. Uh, mi historia es, um, yo estuve trabajando en, el, en, en la ruta 91 ese día. Uh, nosotros no nos han dado... No, les, no nos han puesto mucha importancia, puesto que nosotros somos empleados de los baños. Permítame. Marixa feels that um, not much importance has been given to her and her, um, her peers because they were working as uh, restroom staff cleaners. Mi historia es que todos por igual vivimos lo mismo. Estamos en constante uh, sueño porque no dormimos, porque estuvimos en donde una sola persona quiso matar a todo el montón que estábamos ahí. Permítame. They're not sleeping. They are coping every day um, with a lot of difficulty, um, all because of one individual who shot. Many. Esa persona es responsable de las muertes que hubo ahí, de toda la gente que estuvo ahí, y, y yo pienso que, que pues todos tenemos derecho. She, todos tenemos derecho. She feels that they all have a right for all the people that were at, at the event and affected by the event, but also them who were working in the bathrooms, cleaning them. Um, they also have rights. Um, también quiero decir que... Ay, no se preocupe, dígalo en español. Pues, todos estamos nerviosos, uh, todos nos quedamos sin trabajo, la mayoría de la compañía de nosotros uh, detuvieron el material, para trabajar allá adentro, por lo tanto tuvieron que, que, este, que cortar trabajos. She says as, as a result of the event and, and of the tragedy, her company that she worked for had to cut jobs, and so um, they're not working, um, they've been left without material so that they can work elsewhere. Y, y pues que, Pues a todos nos sentimos muy mal, 
uh, gracias a BBS, nosotros estamos sobreviviendo porque nos dan uh, terapias. Um, she says thank you to BBS because she's gotten therapy through that organization. Y pues solo quiero que también recuerden de nosotros. She, she's here because she wants the committee to remember them as backroom staff, if you will. Tal vez nosotros no, no fuimos dañados uh, con heridas o ir al hospital o X, pero mentalmente estamos dañados. She says that despite the fact that they weren't wounded um, and they weren't, they didn't spend time at hospitals, um, they're still, they're still suffering from different kind of wounds. Y también ayudamos a personas, algunos de mis compañeros uh, ayudaron a personas a salir de ahí, a resguardarse. Uh, viene también mi compañera que ayudó a una persona que estaba herida. She, she says that they too helped victims uh, out of the, the venue and helped people who were hurt, um, her and some of her friends who've come with her. Yo estaba a cargo de unos baños y yo resguardé a unas personas en un contenedor de, de hierro, se puede decir, en donde guardábamos el material para trabajar. She says that she um, was working in one of the bathrooms and she helped some victims um, to hide them in a materials closet. Y pues... Todo esto ha sido difícil para nosotros, para las personas que han sido dañadas, para las personas que no. Igualmente ha sido muy difícil para las personas que fallecieron, she para says su familia. She's, it's been very difficult for them, uh, as well as it's been difficult for the victims and their families. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Victor Rivera. My name is Victor Rivera, and thank you all of you guys to be here to hear our histories. And I was part of the, sorry about my English, I was part of the around 60 workers that we was there. And then we were so happy because we worked hard on Friday and Saturday. And on Sunday, everybody was happy because we we speaking about the we almost there we almost finished it was three hours left and then after that all these things turned to the rain mare and when the shoot start uh, a lot of people on my on me I saw things that I never in my life I seen before and. We, we tried to run to the Tropicana Hotel, and I can forget the one lady was there. Uh, she have a hold on the on the neck, and she was looking at me, asking for help, for help. And I'm like, okay, uh, hold on, let me let me go outside to try to get the ambulance or paramedic. So me and my friend we walk outside. And we we can find any paramedic or ambulance. Only we can find it's uh, more bodies, uh, more people with injuries, blood everywhere. And my history is long, but I um, just want to share a little. Because like uh, the the other person say that we don't get shot or injuries, but. We have something on our mind that we never will forget, and we we thank you to ABBC that they help us with the therapy, and thank you for all the victims of crime because we can go to the clinic too. I have an injury on my neck, on my knees, because I tried to jump a fence, and they took care about me and. I don't know. 
I wish to explain more, but it's hard. Uh, thank you for all you guys to be here to help us. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Um, Barbara? Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Bárbara. Um, una semana antes había trabajado en otro, en otro evento similar. A week prior to the event, she had worked at another event, similar event. Como para el día martes, me llama mi jefe y me dice que si quiero participar por segundo año. On Tuesday, um, the following Tuesday, her uh, supervisor called her and asked her if she wanted to work at the, the uh, uh, Route 91 festival. Dije que sí, pasó el viernes, sábado, y a domingo, yo era muy cansado, tres días. She says that she would work it, and so she worked Friday and Saturday. By Saturday, she was exhausted, and she went on to work Sunday. Diez horas trabajadas diarias. She was working 10 hours a day. Um, me gustó esos días porque la gente nos felicitaba porque me tocó trabajar en el área de un área VIP en limpieza de baños. She was very happy with that job, be, that assignment, because people would congratulate her and thank her for her work. She was working in a VIP area, in the restrooms of a VIP area. She said that the reason that people um, who were using her restrooms were congratulating her is because they were the cleanest restrooms of the event, because they were the VIP area. <laughs> she was proud of that. About 10 minutes, diez para las diez? Diez para las diez. about 10 to 10, she took her last break of the evening. She went to a breakout area, a rotunda, where the rest of her uh, peers were. And at 10 o'clock at night, she went back to her bathrooms to check that, that everything was okay. And then that's when she heard the... Uh, the uh, uh, the gunshots. Fuegos, she thought that they were fireworks. Pero no veía el humo. Yo decía, Esto no. But she didn't see the smoke from Paratexas, so she didn't understand what it was. La de In the second round, and she started seeing people walking fast. They weren't running yet, but they were walking very fast. Dije, pues, Yo inconscientemente de nuevo volví a preguntar qué, qué estaba pasando. So she asked people what was happening. Me dijo una security de ahí que era balazos, que nos fuéramos. A security uh, worker told her that it, they were um, gunshots and that they should leave immediately. Um, yo lo que hice no fue correr, porque en el lugar donde yo estaba había mucha gente desubicada. She says that she decided not to leave. She stayed because there were a lot of people who were confused. So she hunched over. And she started directing people where the exits were. She says that her, at, at, at a certain point, she, her foot got stuck in a, in like a hole. Me pasa una por un lado. And a, a couple passed her at one, on one side of her. And the young man of the couple started screaming for help. She thinks that the young man who was screaming for help and had been hit, that just within a moment, if her foot hadn't been caught and she was bent over when he passed her by, she would have been shot. And that keeps going through her head. 
mucha gente tirada. Seguí caminando, corriendo, ya después. She started running. She started running to leave the event and saw people laying on the ground everywhere. And then she found a young, another young man. Le dije que si estaba bien, él volteó y estaba todo lleno de sangre. She asked him if he was okay, but he was bleeding on one side. And he had a gunshot wound in his collarbone or shoulder. And he fainted in front of her. She thought he had died. She screamed for help, and another couple came to help him. They said that they were going to, for her not to worry, they were going to grab him and take him to an urgent care or a hospital. Después de eso, ya la, los carros querían salir y, y querían, de hecho, se veía hasta como que nos querían atropellar de querer salir del... She de said that cars, car, she was in the parking lot by then and cars were leaving um, so fast that they were, it almost seemed like they were trying to hit people. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't being careful about the people who were in the parking lot trying to run out. Y después empecé a buscar las personas que había ayudado y entre ellos es... She says now what's really bothering her is that she wishes she could meet the people that she helped. She doesn't know how to contact them, but that's what she's with right now. And to give them a hug and thanks, thank God that they're well, that they're okay, that they got out. Somos un grupo de 60, 70 personas latinas que no hemos recibido la ayuda correcta. She says that in total there are about 60, 70 of workers that are Hispanic that no one has reached out to and that they haven't received any help um, at all. No podemos dormir, igual no hemos integrado a nuestro trabajo, muchos sí, unos no, por lo mismo de que... And with, as just with the others that have said tonight they can't sleep, um, they're having a hard time reintegrating into the workforce, um, they're suffering from the same uh, emotions. And she says, thank God that she's alive and she's happy to be here and with everybody else who um, has shared their story. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for all that you've done. Cindy? Hi. Um, I was not at the event at all, but my 17-year-old twin daughters were, and they were both shot there. It was their first concert by themselves without my husband. I, we did not go because, it's, as all of you know, it was a very expensive concert to go to, and with them being seniors in high school, we thought it would be a nice, safe, fun thing for them to be able to do. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details about their story. They didn't feel like talking tonight. Um, one thing I just wanna bring up to all of you on the panel, which thank you for taking your time to do this. Um, one of my daughters, Natalia, um, was shot in the scapula and a uh, bullet ricocheted back and forth through her chest which left her in the hospital for five days in ICU with a collapsed lung. My other daughter, Gianna, was shot in the buttocks and the bullet clearly went all the way through from the rear out to the front of her hip. She was only in the hospital for 12 hours because there were lots of other people with what the hospital saw as much more serious injuries like her sister, though she did spend the week in the hospital with her sister and I by her side the whole time. Also at the event was my niece's fiance. He was shot in the back and he was seen at the hospital and he was um, sent home within about 12 hours like Natalia. And they thought everything was gonna be okay and when he went back for his follow-up MRI, they realized that the bullet, and he's 23 years old, that the bullet is so close to his spine that he could be paralyzed forever and he's going in for surgery on December 18th. Just one thing I want all of you to think about when you think about how you're going to disperse this money. I haven't watched the news a lot lately because I don't know what to believe. And I, everybody has their own opinion um, from family and friends to media to strangers. And I'm thankful for everyone that's reached out. Um, but 
from what I understand or I've seen or heard, that you may be deciding based on how many hospital visits, but that there's a whole hierarchy of family members lost and how many nights in the hospital, people not in the hospital, obviously all these people that are um, traumatized by the event, not even being shot, just being within its presence. Um, but as for my daughters, the only thing I can speak is I feel like they're both is damaged one versus, there isn't one that I feel like deserves more compensation than the next. Um, as a matter of fact, the one that only spent 12 hours in the hospital where the bullet clearly went through her, she still has a wound that's still seeping and oozing um, and requiring um, intensive follow-up. Um, they both take turns of having good days and really bad days. Um, I, everyone in our house, we all kind of walk on eggshells because we don't know what kind of day everyone's going to be dealing with. And the same with my niece's fiance. Um, so just you know, consider that when I know, I can't imagine how hard it is to decide how you're gonna split up all this money. Um, and listening to all these people's stories about the PTSD, it's real. Even as a parent, I'm dealing with it. I feel like I'm a victim, but I wasn't even there. I don't deserve anything, but I can't imagine everyone that was there. So just thank you for doing all this and thank appreciate you, Cindy. it. chiquita. Muy buenas noches. Mi nombre es Juana Maya. Good evening. My name is Juana Maya. Uh, mi historia no es tan diferente como la de todas ustedes. Uh, lo único que, que sí quiero recalcar. Her es, story is not much different than everybody else's, but she does want to point out. Uh, yo también estaba trabajando para limpiar los baños de la zona, de una de las zonas de VIP. She was also cleaning one of the VIP area bathrooms. Y créanme que entre el público he buscado las caritas que yo vi tan alegres. No las he podido encontrar otra vez. She says that what she's been uh, stuck with is looking for the happy faces that she saw at the concert that she can no longer find. Ahora, uh, es un tiroteo, pasaron muchas cosas, uh, lo único que sí, para no alargarme tanto. She says that she understands it was a shooting, but under the circumstances. Uh, solo les puedo decir que vi gente tirada. Tengo 27 años de vivir aquí en Las Vegas. She says that all she remembers from that night are, are people um, wounded and lying on the ground and dead people on the ground. And she's lived in Las Vegas for 27 years. Y, sorry, pero no hablo inglés. Lo siento, pero no hablo inglés y... Despite her 27 years, she says she's sorry she doesn't still speak English yet. <laughs> Porque mi esposo y yo traíamos hijos y nos dedicamos a trabajar. Eso fue toda nuestra vida. She Está says trabajando. because her and her husband have dedicated their lives here to work and raising their children. Ah, uh, entonces cuando pasó todo eso y logré salir del baño, uh, lo único que vimos entre mi esposo y yo es que había gente tirada. She says that she came out of the VIP area bathrooms and to see what was going on and she saw bodies everywhere. Y la verdad, yo tenía mucho miedo de dar mi reporte de policía. She says she was very scared to give her report to the police. Y les voy a decir porque dicen que un herido no se debe de mover. She said she, said she was very scared because of the saying that when you see a wounded person or dead person, well, a wounded person, a fatally wounded person on the ground, you should never move them or touch them. Pero, uh, pocas veces mi esposo y yo nos entendemos con la mirada, muy pocas veces, pero a pesar de que tenemos 40 años, pero vimos a la gente y no era posible que la demás gente pasara encima de los heridos. She's, but she said that her husband and her have been together for 40 years, so after 40 years of marriage, it just takes a look between the two of them and they understand what the other one was thinking. And the bottom line is that they couldn't believe or understand why people were running past the wounded or the dead on the ground and not tending to them. Entonces nuestra reacción fue empezar a ayudar a sacar a la gente. So their reaction was to start 
helping to take people out. No sé si sacamos gente muerta porque estaba inerte. She doesn't even know if some of the people they pulled out were from their area were dead. They were, um, or if they were just unconscious. Si vimos a gente herida que tenía en el estómago, la sacamos. Gente que no podía ya caminar porque sus piernas se les doblaban. She said that they did, they did uh, help some people who were shot in the stomach, uh, some people who were shot elsewhere, but either way they couldn't walk, so they had to help them, had to help carry them. Y la verdad, en ese, en ese momento yo me di cuenta que tanto güeritos como prietitos somos lo mismo. Los dos estábamos expuestos She says a morir. She says that regardless of our color, um, we're all destined to die. We're all vulnerable to death. Lo único malo es que no me fijé si eran grandes, gorditos o, o cómo. El caso es que terminé lasti terminamos lastimados de la espalda porque en ese momento la adrenalina no te dejaba pensar. She said that in the moment the adrenaline doesn't let you pay attention to whether a person is very big or small or medium sized either way they were pulling them out and as a result both of them have back injuries pero uh, lo que yo les quiero pedir hay mucha de mi gente que no viene porque no tiene papeles y yo sé yo sé que ustedes uh, son buenas personas lo demostraron ahí en ese concierto y no vienen por miedo pero quiero que sepan que si alguno de ustedes tiene trabajo, y no lo estoy pidiendo nada más para mí. Todo el grupo de personas que hablaban mis compañeras, estamos sobreviviendo de latas de comida que nos dan. Uh, Permítame. She says that one of the things that she recognizes, and hopefully you do, is that many of her people are not here because they're not legal. Um, uh, Uh, y muchos no vienen por miedo. Mm -hmm. And they're scared. They don't come because they're scared. Dijeron que les iban a ayudar con la visa U, pero yo no, no sé. Um, she says that amongst them that they heard that they were going to be helped. Um, con la visa, dice. Vi la visa U de víctimas. Con el fondo. Uh -huh. No, con la visa U. De víctimas oh, that víctimas. they were going to be helped with the visa for victims. Y hay otra cosa que también les quiero decir. Créanme que envidio a la gente que puede llorar. She says, one thing I want you to know is that I envy the people who can cry. Tengo las, las imágenes en mi cabeza y como ven, sí, sí, se me hace un nudo en la garganta, pero no he podido llorar. She says that she's got these images in her head um, and a big knot in her throat and yet she still can't cry. Y... Si sí, quiero pedirles ayuda para todos mis compañeros que estamos en la misma situación, sin trabajo, sin dinero. Despite that, she's here on behalf of all her friends, um, Hispanic friends who were there working. Um, she doesn't have any money now because she's not working and they're in the same position. Y a una compañera mía le llegó el bill de 20 mil dólares y no sabe qué hacer. She says one of her... Um, Her uh, worker friends re just received a bill for $20,000 dollars del hospital sí. from the hospital, and she doesn't know what she's going to do. Y muchas gracias por su atención y que nos hayan escuchado y, y, y esperamos que las que trabajamos en el baño las hayamos atendido bien. She gracias. says, thank you for your attention, um, and uh, she hopes that you have listened to her so that you can Um, help them as well, and if she, they assisted you in the VIP bathroom, she says, <laughs> uh, que las bien. she hopes that she served you well. Thank you. I do, I do want to take a moment and reiterate that no one should be afraid to come forward for help based on their immigration status. That help is available. And I know from my experience with the Pulse nightclub, we had a number of people who were victims of the Pulse shooting that were undocumented. They all got benefits. They were not, there was no restriction on that. And many of those people did get the crime victim visa because they were assisting in the investigation and prosecution of that crime. So that does happen, so people should not be afraid to come forward. For someone, for your friend who got a $20,000 hospital bill and doesn't know what to do, 
they should apply for crime victim compensation because not only will crime victim compensation, if they don't have insurance, not only will crime victim compensation help pay that, when there is a pending crime victim compensation application, creditors and hospitals cannot go after you. You're protected when, there's, uh, when you've got a pending compensation claim. Uh, so they should come forward for help. I want to thank all of you for your courage in share, giving voice to your stories that so many of you shared and your common experience. Um, for many people, it was difficult to listen to, but that pales in comparison to what each of you endured and continue to experience every day. And so it was critically, critically important for you to bear witness to that experience so that these folks, these dedicated volunteers on the committee understand the reality of what each of you are dealing with. And I know that they will take everything that you've said to heart and do their very best to try and help as many people as possible. Thank you all so much for your time and for coming. Please, we want to hear from you. We want to uh, continue to be able to provide information. I know there's folks from the Resiliency Center that are outside. No one is going to go through this alone. Please don't be afraid to ask for help. I sp spoke with a woman who was injured in the Oklahoma City bombing. Her office was across the street from the Murrah building, and when that bomb went off, all the glass from the windows came in on her. And she endured miles of stitches to put her back together. And she coined a phrase that she called the blessing curse because she said for everything that happens, there's a good part and a bad part. She said the horrible thing about Oklahoma City was that so many people were killed and injured. But the blessing part of that was it was something that all of those people and that entire community went through together. She said she had a friend who lived in New York City and had been mugged and beaten, and nobody cared, and he suffered through that alone. And so while something, an atrocity, has occurred here, at least everybody in this city understands this, and you don't have to go through this alone. And so if you need help, please do not be afraid to ask. Thank you all for coming, and we'll stick with you through this. Good night.